Welcome into a Monday edition of the Roadwire Fantasy Basketball Pod. Nick Whalen, Alex Barutha here with you as we are every Monday. Uh, Alex, I want to get out ahead of the narrative. I am sick. Uh, that's why my eyes look terrible, why my voice sounds terrible. I don't want to hear about it in the comments. We will push through. Um, you know, getting to the end now of the fantasy basketball season. Some leagues wrapping up. I know the Roadwire Stake League finishes up after this week. There's still some leagues out there that do go through game 82, but uh, you know, certainly entering a uh, slower part, I suppose, of the fantasy season. But a lot going on uh, in the real life NBA, including the Golden State Warriors uh, suddenly losing their foothold on what could be the final play in spot in the Western Conference. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's pretty surprising. I mean, when when Elper and Shangun got hurt, we sort of like we just wrote off Houston. It was like, oh, yeah. they're they're done. You know, Shangun's not coming back. And then all of a sudden. Houston can't lose a game. Uh, And Jabari Smith at center is working out for them. Uh, I think it's opening up the, well, it is opening up the floor a little bit more. And Jalen Green's able to operate with some space. And uh, they're they're pushing up the standings. And Golden State's been, uh, you know, I would say like underwhelming to average recently during this stretch. Yeah, I mean, Houston, for one, you kind of forget, they got off to a good start, right? I mean, this team was 6-3 and three early on. We were talking about them as, you know, maybe this surprise team out West. I mean, they were essentially 500 at the halfway mark and then, you know, really hit a rough patch in February going into the All-Star break. They've had a somewhat easy schedule here. Like, their, their wins during this streak have come over Portland, Sacramento, San Antonio, Washington, Cleveland, Washington, Chicago, Utah. So that's that's definitely part of it. But they've they've won a lot of these games handily. I mean, they just housed the Utah Jazz. Uh, at home on Saturday, they get another pretty appealing matchup uh, tonight against a Portland Trailblazers team that started all rookies in one game over the weekend. Uh, that's where we're at with Portland. After that, they're at OKC on Wednesday. Uh, another good matchup on Friday at Utah. They do have a slightly harder schedule the rest of the way than Golden State does, but it's not. It, it's you know it's not a complete minefield. You know, I, I think you, you take the Warriors' experience, you take their schedule, you take their players obviously over what we have in Houston here, but I, I don't think it's just decided that Golden State can necessarily flip a switch here. I, I do think the Warriors end up making it. I would be, I mean, this would be one of the stories of the season if the Warriors somehow find a way to back out of the play-in. But concurrent with all this is that, you know, the Lakers have been playing fairly well. You know, they, they now are as many games above 500 as they've been at any point this season. You know, they're looking like they're going to have a pretty good chance to maybe, you know, maybe snag the, the seven or the eight in the West. I, I wouldn't count on it. I mean, they're two and a half back of Sacramento and Dallas, but uh, at the very least, you know, would have home court in, in what would be the nine, 10 play in matchup against golden state or Houston. Yeah, what, what is going on with the warrior side of this? I think it's, it's kind of obvious with Houston, right? It's like soft schedule court opening up Jalen green playing well. Uh, maybe we didn't see this coming, but the golden state side of it is, is very interesting to me. You know, Steph Curry was a little miffed. I think as far as how many minutes he played last night uh, in their loss, you know, obviously they made the move earlier in the season, with Clay Thompson coming off the bench, Kaminga continues to play pretty well. You know, they're getting good minutes uh, out of Trace Jackson Davis. Chris Paul's back in the mix. Like it's, it's hard for me to find a reason, you know, why Golden State would be seemingly, I wouldn't say full on collapsing, but uh, playing some of its shakiest basketball of the season right now. Yeah, it's hard to say because, you know, they had a hot stretch earlier coming out of the yeah. all-star break. And um, I just think. Yeah, sometimes it happens where a team is they're they're really up back against a wall. They get her, they get their guy back and Draymond. They're all they're firing on all cylinders. Um, but then I think it's a lot. They just they've kind of regressed. Like Wiggins is shooting a little bit better, but he's still only giving you like twelve points a game. Yeah, you know he's not really doing much for you. Clay, you know Clay's shooting better from three and everything, but again, like that's all he's doing for you. Um, yeah. Chris Paul has his games but honestly at this point it's like he's just out there to pass and commit like no turnovers like he's just holding down the fort so um you know it's i i think what they experienced before was just an unreasonable hot stretch and now they've sort of regressed to the mean a little bit with with their play so we always check in on the play in odds at the DraftKings sportsbook i mean everybody you know loves that loves hearing about that warriors are minus 2500 to participate in the play in and Houston is six to one, which is interesting to me. Mm. So the books aren't really books aren't really backing off. The Lakers are minus fifty thousand. I mean, they're essentially locked in at this point. Uh, Atlanta's minus ten thousand, um, you know, to to make the play in in the East. So we, we kind of know, you know, in general what what group of teams we're looking at here. But 
Um, surprising a, a little bit that Golden State is still holding firm at such a strong number at 2,500 because, you know, undoubtedly the Rockets have looked like the better team over these last couple of weeks. I will ask you uh, what, unfortunately, I feel like is an impossible question. Do we buy in on what we've seen from Jalen Green since Shangun went down? He's had these stretches before, you know, including, I think it was at the end of his rookie year, you know, had a pretty shaky, like first 70 games. And then, you know, at the end, we're like, oh, okay, here we go. This is maybe more what we expected. Is this just, is this just kind of a volume equation, you know, beating up on some bad defenses? Has your opinion on Jalen Green been shape it all over the last few weeks um i mean it's it's partially a volume equation because he is taking 21 shots a game over the past 12 but he's shooting you know uh basically 50 40 80 he's still really not doing anything from an assist perspective but i think i, I don't want to say he doesn't necessarily mesh with shangun but there are uh, green's athleticism is so high that if you just give him all the floor space in the world with, you know, Jabari Smith uh, spacing at the five and Amon Thompson, you know, just kind of doing out utility stuff, setting screens, rolling, hanging out by the basket, running really hard in transition, you know, they're going to be a better transition team like this too. Um, it does allow Green some more room to operate and, and get some freely, get some better looks, I guess, for his, for his shot diet. Yeah, I... You know, I, I still think that Jalen Green has a lot to prove as far as not being a good stats, bad team guy. But, at, you know, you'll take it, right? I mean, it's, it's certainly not a negative to, to see somebody putting up like 35 game over his last four. Like we, we've kind of known that he's capable of this and you still want to see it, even if it's coming against Portland and Washington and San Antonio. And, um, you know, obviously it would be a, a hell of a story if he's able to keep this up over a tougher schedule the rest of the way. Uh, we, we don't have a ton in terms of news this week, which is – Mostly a good thing because news tends to be injury news. Um, you know, the, the big one would be Brandon Ingram. You know, that was late last week. We found out he's going to miss some time, at least another week and a half dealing with a, a bone bruise in his left knee. You know, wouldn't be surprised if that lingers a bit longer. You know, that's when they'll reevaluate him was that two week timetable, not when he'll necessarily be back. Uh, Pelicans have been just fine without him so far. They've taken down Miami and Detroit. Both of those wins coming by double digit. Pels 11 and five with a plus 9.4 net rating since the All-Star break, third best net rating behind only Boston and Denver. Uh, talked about this a little bit on the Roadwire NBA show. Hopefully you, you listened last week. Um, but, you know, how seriously do we have to take the Pels at this point? Because they are they're only a half game back of the LA Clippers for the four seed. And LA, the Clippers now have basically been a 500 outfit since the All-Star break. Yeah, to me, to me, this is also more, it's almost more like I'm, yeah, the Clippers are becoming concerning while the Pelicans are like on a hot streak and they're sort of colliding, like you mentioned. I mean, I, I've always been of the belief that we should take the Pelicans seriously as long as they're healthy. Now, you mentioned Ingram is going to be out for a while, so we'll see kind of what happens. But, you know, the thing that makes the Pelicans, I think, intimidating as a, as a potential playoff opponent is not only like the explosive scoring ability of Zion Williamson and everything Brandon Ingram can do as like an all-star caliber player, uh, McCollum being a veteran point guard and all that, but they have so many different looks they can go to. You know, I think I think they're getting this far in terms of being a great offense and defense by having a ton of different lineups that they can throw out there. They can go Larry Nance at center. They can go Zion at center. They can play Herb Jones and Trey Murphy at the same time. If they need a quick scoring punch against a small team, they can move Jordan Hawkins. If there's a point guard giving them trouble, you throw Alvarado in there. Um, and being able to sort of form to the matchup at hand while keeping most like most of your best players on the court the whole time is it's really powerful. Yeah, I mean, we said it at the beginning of the year, right? They have as much depth, if not more, than any team in the league. And I, I think for fantasy, it was almost a bad thing at times because when they are fully healthy, you know, you're playing the well, do I start Trey Murphy? Do I start Herb Jones? Like there are only so many sure things in that rotation. But this is one of the few teams in the NBA that can sustain, you know, the loss of someone like Brandon Ingram for a couple of weeks. I will say we're, we're going to find out if this team is for real in the next week and a half because their next five games come against OKC tomorrow, Milwaukee Thursday, Boston Saturday, next Monday, Phoenix, next Wednesday, Orlando. That is about as tough yeah. of a five-game stretch as it gets, although uh, they do get all five of those at home. That is nice. Yeah, that's going to be tough without Ingram. I think that's maybe where we start to see the the sort of drain of, of Ingram not being there. But again, you know, they're just going to give more minutes to the guys they already are comfortable playing. And I think you just run more points Zion and it can work out. 
All right, we've got a couple questions in the chat here. Feel free to throw those in there, guys. I know, you know, fantasy playoffs ongoing. Uh, some leagues have wrapped up, but we'll dish out as much advice as we can. Uh, Johnny says, what's up, fellas? What's up, man? Uh, Holmes or Bagley or roster both? He's in the semifinals of a nine-cat league. Uh, first of all, the schedule this week, it's about, it's like 60-40 four games versus three games. We don't have any five game weeks. We don't have any two game weeks. Thankfully uh, the wizards are on a four game week. Uh, they play at Chicago, Brooklyn, Detroit, and then Miami. So pretty decent schedule uh, for this week with that in mind. You know, I don't necessarily don't necessarily hate rostering both of those guys. I mean, it, it depends how big your league is, who else is available. As we always say, um, are you starting both of them? Are you, are you kind of playing the matchup night to night? Um, I, I assume you're just going to blindly say Marvin Bagley out. <laughs> well, you forgot how much I love Rashawn Holmes also. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't believe Holmes is already 30. I yeah, yeah. I think you can roster both because I am not 100% sure what Washington plans on doing now that Bagley's healthy. You know, Bagley came back for their most recent game, played 16 minutes off the bench. Holmes minutes didn't move at all. He started, played 28, and worked for 15 and 14 yeah. with two blocks. So it's like, okay, are they going to bring Marvin Bagley off the bench now? Or are they going to... Could, could they just start Marvin Bagley and then Rashawn Holmes is getting like DMPs or like 12 minutes a game again? Yes, that's possible. I would prefer if you can to hold both and just see what Washington does. Yeah, I think if you have to hold one or the other, it, it probably has to be Holmes right now just because Bagley missed so much time. He's only played one game. You know, maybe those minutes do rise. Um, and likely they would, I, I would imagine. But uh, I think if you're choosing between one or the other, I would go Holmes. Um, you know, in terms of other potential pickups in your average league. It's like, it's, it's maybe Paul Reed sitting out there, you know, Taylor Hendricks, perhaps, you know, both of those guys uh, are on four game weeks this week. Uh, but again, without, without knowing the league size, you know, it's kind of hard to say if you could do better, but um, you know, we, we also, the other thing with Washington is like either of those guys are liable to miss any games the rest of the way, right? Like you might, you might want to have one or the other because it's totally possible that both are not available for all, all four games this week. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't as bad as it was like a week or a week and a half ago, but you look at the sort of recent game logs of Washington and it's like over the past five games, <clears throat> Kuzma's missed two, Avdia's missed three. Um, I was going to say this like it mattered, but it kind of does. Anthony Gill missed a game because he was Whoa. playing 20 minutes oh a game. Goodness. I know. Um, like Johnny Davis is out there getting run and stuff. So it's like, I, it's it's hard. to Tyus Jones remains out. So it's, it's yeah. it, Washington is going to be, I think as tough to predict the rotation of going forward as any team really in the bottom six or seven. Is Johnny Davis going to be in the NBA next year, by the way? I mean, this is, this is rough. This, the, the opportunities have been there. He's, you know, he's back to the bench. Now he made that, that one glorious start against Houston last week. I, I mean, he's probably the worst lottery pick of the last five to 10 years without doing deep research here. I think, well, look, I mean, they got him. They got the team option for another two years, um, basically five million and then six million. I think if you're Washington, look, I, I think from an optics perspective, you should probably just hang on to him because it's like, what are you going to do with that five million or six million dollars anyway? And if your team is going to continue to be bad, it's yeah. like you may as well just you may as well just see if you can like Killian Hayes it. And like, can we just really can we force this guy to get fifteen minutes a game? no matter what, and just make them, you know, make it work. Um, and whether or not we give them a second contract is another story. Yeah, things are things are bleak right now. Uh, Johnny followed up and asked, is Chemezi met to a solid stream? Well, unfortunately, that's a very fair question because, I mean, Detroit, they're like 17-point dogs tonight. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is they're down Duran, they're down Cade. They're down Fontecchio. They're they're down Isaiah Stewart for the rest of the season. They're down Taj Gibson. So they're they're basically running out of depth up front, which means that we'll likely see a lot of Metu as we did in their last game, played 38 minutes. Um, probably see a lot of James Wiseman as well. Uh, my, my first thing would be that Detroit's on a three-game week. So it, it kind of depends. If you're in a daily lineup league, yeah, I don't mind throwing them out there. Could you do better with somebody? You know, if, if it's weekly, probably want the four games. Yeah, probably. I mean. Look, I, I don't mind Matu. I think that he has been, he was a solid backup and maybe even sometimes an underutilized backup in, in uh, Sacramento for a few years. Just very capable of giving you like that, you know, basically 15 and 10 yeah. with a block or a steal, sort of classic big man. 
Um, can also give you a three here and there. So, like, is he a solid stream? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. I thought you were going to say no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Not really. Um, well, he's played more than 20 minutes seven times this season between Phoenix and Detroit. And in those games, he's averaging 13 and a half points, seven boards, one assist, one and a half steals, one and a half threes. So I, I think that's reasonable baseline. And, you know, if it, it really comes down to Duran, right? Like if Duran misses the entire week, then yeah, yeah, I think he becomes really viable. Yeah. You're hoping Duran remains out. And again, with a team like this, there's no reason mm-hmm. to rush Duran back. Um, all right. Don Sicario says he's debating dropping Anthony Simons and picking up a Pelican for the week. Uh, yeah. Interesting concept here. I mean, Portland for one is on a three game week. And Anthony Simons is already ruled out for the first of those, which is tonight against Houston. So you're looking at a two game week for Simons. He got injured against the Clippers, uh, you know, a couple of nights ago. Prior to that, you know, they were they were blown out by the Clippers. Played only 28 minutes. Before that, I mean, he'd still been playing a full workload, like 38 to, to 42 minutes most nights. But in what now amounts to a two game week at best, I don't really have a problem with it. Um, you know, as far as like, do you have to pick up a Pelican specifically? They're on a three game week. So, if, like, you know, if somebody good is out there, yeah, of course, if you're in a shallow league, I, I don't mind it. But again, if, if you're if you're looking to, you know, basically stream for a week in, in the fantasy playoffs, I'm still prioritizing games played. So I wouldn't I wouldn't go too deep on the Pelicans specifically, uh, especially like we said, I mean, with these these tough matchups coming up. Yeah, I think it's tough with Simons. It's listed as tendonitis. That's like a rest injury. Like you have to rest it to recover it. And of course, yeah, we know how Portland is. I mean, Nick mentioned they started all rookies the other night. Um, picking up a Pelican, yeah. I mean, if you want to pick up a Pelican in the in the wake of the Ingram news, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I don't know 100 percent who's available in your league, but Larry Nance, Najee Marshall, um, are guys who could be available depending on your league size. I, I that to me, that's a little too much risk. Because Simons could come back and average like twenty five and five mm-hmm. um, in the games that he plays, but I understand if if you're in a if you're in a must win like you have to win this matchup situation. I understand the move. Uh, all right, Tory Thompson says I have a buy this week. Is it worth it to pick up Trey Young or Tyler Hero in case we get positive news in the coming days? Don't really need them, but I'm greedy. LOL. Head to head category league. Uh, no, I, I, this is not greedy. I think this is, this is gamesmanship here. Um, I, I think the question is, which of these guys do we feel, you know, more strongly about? I, to me, it would be Trey Young. I mean, we haven't really gotten much of a positive update on either of them. You know, Hero, I don't know what's going on with Hero, man. I mean, he hasn't played since February 23rd. Uh, we haven't received an update on him in almost 10 days now. He had a PRP injection in his foot. My guess is Miami is, you know, they're in playoff mode with Hero, right? They just need him back for when it matters. Um, Atlanta's banged up all over the place right now. You know, the, the Trey Young thing is, is strange because you, given, you know, his profile as a player, you'd think we'd have something over the last couple of weeks. This could just be one of those classic, like Shams, you know, tweets at 5 30 PM. Trey Young is now questionable for tonight. You know, he could be back at some point in the next couple of weeks. I would say if you, if you have the roster space, sure. Right. If you're on a buy this week, if you don't have to drop somebody of consequence, I think Trey Young would, would be the guy for me, they announced on February 25th that he would undergo surgery and they, they gave him, you know, kind of a four week evaluation timeline, which would be hitting like now. Yeah. The hero thing is, I mean, Miami's kind of dodgy with their injury reporting. Anyway, it's a foot injury, which is very tough to come back from, you know, last year they did, they kind of proved they didn't need him that much. Um, yeah. I'm still, I'm still like a Tyler hero like optimist, I think it's. I don't think it's a situation where it's like they're better without Hero, or they should they oh, they should trade him because he's useless. I'm not that kind of a guy. Um, but Trey Young, I mean, yeah, I wish we had more updates on him, but it's a left hand injury. If they really wanted him to come back, I think it would be it could be sooner. I want to say it could be sooner than Hero, but it'd be easier to sort of force Trey Young to come back for the playoffs than Hero. Yeah. If that makes sense. And Atlanta well, is basically they're locked. They're not forced seat. to come back, but e- like it's easier to play through discomfort with your offhand than it is your foot. right. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it, you know, it's it's hard to say like oh one of them there's incentive for one of them to stick out longer than the other one. I don't know. I mean, maybe Miami really wants to get into the sixth seed um, to avoid the play in. 
but Atlanta is just locked into the 10 seed. I mean, they're not right. going to slip below Brooklyn. So there's that, there's that too. Yeah. I, I, again, I'll say if you have the roster space, just go grab Trey young. You know, if you're not dropping somebody who you're planning on using next week, I, I don't really see why not. Uh, Michael says I'm facing Zion and Trey Murphy this week. Any strategies to counter or am I just totally screwed? LOL. I'm nervous as hell. Uh, so I assume this is, you know, like a head to head, you know, points are probably categories league. If you're talking about countering, uh, Trey Murphy's coming off of one of the all time weirdest lines ever yesterday, uh, eight points, eight boards, four blocks, O of nine from three, one of 12 from the field. And yet still gave you a, a decent line. Um, in terms of countering, I mean, obviously with Trey Murphy, you're most worried about the volume threes, right? He's been rebounding really well. You know, the defensive stats are there every now and then, but it's, it's really, you know, your fear is that he has like three games in a row this week where he hits four or five threes and all of a sudden you're trailing in that category. So I, I think for Murphy, the strategy is either, you know, make sure you're starting or you're picking up somebody who you think can, you know, give you threes to try to counter that, or just say, all right, you know, and maybe this, maybe this person you're playing has other, you know, three point studs on the roster and say, all right, we'll, we'll chalk up that category as a loss and target something else. I mean, with Zion, obviously the production is, is more well-rounded, especially with no Ingram. I think we're going to see the passing tick back up as we did the other night against Detroit six assists. Um, I mean, the steals, the blocks have started to come around for Zion. That was kind of one of the big criticisms over the last couple of years, even when he was healthy was okay. We're seeing the scoring, the field goal percentage is great. He looks dominant but he's not really the defensive player that he was at Duke. Like that's starting to come back. The rebounding has been great since the all-star break. So I don't really know that there's a way to, to counter Zion. I guess the one you know big pitfall for him, and even this has been better lately, is the free throw shooting, right? I mean, he's been in like the mid-70s over the last month, which for Zion is pretty good. But, you know, I, th I think that's maybe one area you could try to exploit is, you know, you're, you're hoping that Zion has a couple of those games where he's 7 of 12 at the line, and, and maybe you could sneak out a victory in that category. Right. I mean, countering is tough because it's like, do you are you do you just avoid the categories that the other guys are good in to try to get, you know, get wins elsewhere? You know, right. it's like because if you're if you're talking about these three guy or these two guys, it's like Trey Murphy's gonna be good in three, Zion's gonna be good in points and field goal percentage, or like those are their best categories. It's like, should you just avoid those entirely and just say, Hey, that's a loss? I'll go for I'll go for rebounds, uh, you know, I'll go for assists, I'll go for steals and blocks. It's it's tough to give you like a strong um, counter without knowing your team, yeah. and, like your full team construction. Well, and, and the Pels are on a three game week, right? So like, I don't, I wouldn't base your whole week around this. You know, it's like, I, I think, you know, one example would be, you know, especially early in the season when he was rolling, like if you're going up against Tyrese Halliburton and he has four games, it might be tough for you to win assists because he was giving yeah. you like 13 assists per game for a while there. Um, but you know, three games of, of Zion, who's, you know, still not the, like, the greatest fantasy player, not as, as well-rounded historically as you would like. Uh, Trey Murphy, as he proved yesterday, is still capable of going 0 for 9 and then, you know, going 5 for 10 the next game. I, I wouldn't necessarily panic about this. Um, obviously, if you're in a position that you're still playing, you know, your team is pretty good here. And, and really, the rest of your opponent's roster, you know, matters too. I, I wouldn't just worry about those two guys. Um, all right, back to Johnny. He says, Keon Ellis or Bruno Fernando? Who's a, are, are, would those guys be a better pickup than Chimezi Metu? I would rather have Metu than Fernando, I think. Um, I know that the, the Hawks are without a Kung Wu for at least one game. And Jalen Johnson certainly could be more. We'll see. Um, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, the big unknown right now. But I, I do kind of like Keon Ellis, man. I mean, he's been in the rotation for a while. He basically usurped Davion Mitchell's spot, you know, a while back. And with Kevin Herter sideline now, you know, coming off of a big game against Orlando, 19 points, six assists, five boards, four threes. I would like to buy into that at the same time. There's been a lot of other nights where he's played bigger minutes and is not produced like that. So it, it could be a little bit of fool's gold, but I, I don't mind Keon Nellis on a four game week. I think, um, well, yeah, some of it, it's like, if, if you want the guy long-term, I mean, I, I, I don't think necessarily Ellis or Fernando are better for this week, but I think what, what Keon Ellis is doing is more sustainable long-term. So if you're looking to pick up a guy, for this week who could also extend through the end of the season. I would go with Ellis. I mean, Kevin Herter is done for the year. Um, yeah. And Ellis, Ellis was already stealing his minutes too. I mean, you mentioned Davion Mitchell's minutes, but Herter was really bad towards the end of the season. Um, and Ellis, look, he's, he's not going to do that much for you besides steals and blocks. Like you watch him play. He's just out there for defense. Very, very similar to Davion Mitchell. They just kind of like him more than Davion Mitchell. 
So, you know, over the past, what is it, seven games, he's given you 2.3 steals, 1.3 blocks. I mean, that's like, he's sort of like a Matisse Thibault, even though they're, yeah. they're not really the same player. Um, good, good note by you on Herder, by the way, that we did get official confirmation that he is out for the season. Uh, obviously we knew about the, the injury about a week ago, but King said, even, you know, even for the playoffs, he's not coming back this year. So a uh, pretty big blow for Sacramento. Uh, Raul Gupta says, I have Levert, Hartenstein, Nas Reed, and Bogdan Bogdanovich. Would Brooke Lopez and or Paul Reed be better than any of those guys? You know, right away you're thinking, oh, Brooke Lopez. Yeah. He's gotta be better. You know, he was so great earlier in the season. Uh, basically, as soon as I traded for him, Alex, in the stake league, the, the production has fallen off a cliff. I mean, he's basically been a one block per game guy over the last month. You know, the scoring still there here and there every now and then. You know, it kind of depends. Is he is he draining the 29 foot pull up threes or not? Uh, it's kind of what it comes down to. We know who he is as a, as a rebounder and a passer. It's going to be spotty. So I would, I would like to say Lopez right away, but I, I don't really think that's the case right now. Yeah, I think I'd be most okay with letting Bogdanovich go. I think he has the the lowest upside of of that initial group that you mentioned. So, uh, look, I think if you need if you need big man stats, um, I wouldn't mind dropping Bogdanovich for Lopez or Reed. Reed's gonna get you more traditional big man stats than Lopez because mm -hmm. Reed Reed will rebound and he'll block more shots and stuff like that. But um, uh, Lopez doesn't rebound that much, hits threes, etc. Yeah. Um, so it depends what you need. Depends what you need. Yeah, Lopez on a three game week, don't really want it. Uh, Nas Reed has a three game week this this week as well. Paul Reed's on a four gamer. Um, so I would I would stay away from Lopez. Hardenstein's been really good of late. Knicks are on a four gamer. I would, wouldn't worry about that. Um, you know, I, I think in a roundabout way, like OG being out kind of helps him a little bit. Um, and you know, Knicks still fighting for playoff positions. So I don't I don't necessarily think they. They really slow down here. Um, I want to back up to a uh, Shangun question that we had earlier. Uh, this one is, any chance Shangun comes back? I saw a rumor yesterday. And he's on waivers in my league. I'd be pretty surprised. Um, you know, I mean, the, the last update in, you know, non-rumor update that we had is that he's likely out for the regular season. Uh, but obviously the way, the way the Rockets are playing, it's like, I don't know if you're, if you're saying and you have any chance to return, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's certainly possible, but I wouldn't really count on it. Like I, to me, this is more of like a real life consideration than fantasy. It's like, even if he does return by the time that happens, like unless your league goes through game 82 and you have a spot, you know, kind of like we said with Trey young, if, if you can hold him and you're not giving up anything, I don't really see any downside, but um, if, if you need that spot, especially for the week ahead, like he's, he's definitely not coming back in the next week. Yeah, I I, I kind of tracked down the rumor. Something Tim McMahon said. I, I don't know yeah. where he where he got it from, but um, that it's possible that if it really comes down to it, that Shengu could come back for the very end of the regular season. Um, yeah. Which was sort of the reporting, and the reporting initially was likely out for the regular season. Uh, I think that was also. I don't think Houston anticipated winning eight straight without Shengu, uh, so they were like, eh, "It's fine." Yeah. Um, I would say it's not worth picking him up if your league ends before the last week of the season. Like, um, if your league goes all the way through 82, I don't hate the idea of picking him up maybe for the last week, but I don't know if that's really going to pay off either way. It's kind of a long shot move. Yeah, I mean, the way that big man phrased it, you know, it. I think you you put it pretty well. It was like, they, they essentially said he's probably out because they thought their season was over. And now it's like, well, maybe, maybe. Um, and, you know, the exact verbiage was, quote, in the realm of possibility. You know, I, it's not like he's ramping up or anything. Like he's still still recovering from what was not as severe of an injury as we thought, but ultimately a pretty severe ankle sprain. So, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, if anything, obviously you, you don't want news to come out that he's like on track to return and then maybe you missed your window. But I would, assuming you, you know, you're you're in a fantasy playoff situation, you need to win this week. You need to win next week. You probably want that roster spot. You know, maybe grab him a week from now uh, if that possibility is still out there. Uh, Daniel says, Scoot is recently putting up nice numbers with a manageable field goal percentage the last couple of games. How boosted is is he with Simon sideline? Is he a must own in a ten team nine cat league? Well, um. Six straight games of uh, double-digit scoring for Scoot, which is actually notable. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, 40% from the field, 38% from three, 5.7 assists to 3.5 turnovers, 1.7 steals for, for 17 points. That's good stuff. It's good stuff from Scoot. I mean, that's if, if that's what he was averaging all year, we'd be like, okay, nice rookie season, solid. Um, is he a must roster in a 10 team nine cat? I think it would be good. It probably makes sense for someone to pick him up because look, it's a nine cat league, but I'm going to assume that at least half the teams, if not 80% of the teams are just punting turnovers and probably a decent amount of other teams are punting field goal percentage. You might be doing that. If you're punting one of those two, absolutely pick him up. If yeah. you're focusing on one of those two, do not pick him up. And if whether or not you win turnovers or field goal percentage is kind of like a wash to you, you're it's just whatever, then uh, you can stream them in. Sure, why not? So to answer one of the questions here, I, I wouldn't say he's a must own in a 10 team league just because there are enough guys out there. Um, and he's like the the nine cat thing is what matters to me because the turnovers are are a killer. Um, I mean, he's still there. He could average like five turnovers in a week and that's going to be tough to come back from. They do only have a three game week this week as well. Uh, so that's something to consider, but yeah, I think you brought up a good point. I mean, if these were season long numbers, we'd be feeling a lot better. And you watch some of these games, like he's, he's still making a lot of mistakes. I'm still a little reserved as far as, you know, is this going to go like we thought it might, uh, on draft night, you know, it's been a pretty rough rookie season for him overall, but he's. It's going to have a nice three-week runway here, I think, to, to put up some numbers uh, for what's left of the Blazers. And, and who knows what happens with the Simons thing. I mean, anybody anybody who's not a rookie is basically liable to be to be shut down at this point for Portland. Um, another Brooke Lopez question. Would Lopez be considered a drop for someone like Trace Jackson Davis, Chemezi Metu, Luke Cornett, or Keon Ellis? I, w- I would not drop Lopez for Cornett. And I would probably hesitate to drop him for Metu. But... I don't, I'm not really going to scoff at you for wanting to drop Brooke Lopez for, for Trace Jackson Davis, who has been really consistent. Um, and over the past 10 games has averaged 11 points, eight rebounds, two blocks. No, he's not giving you the threes, but that's not what you're asking about. You're asking about the rebounds. Uh, or I, I don't know if you, yeah, you are asking about the rebounds. Um, and yeah, like Lopez versus Keon Ellis. Uh, I mean, yeah, Keon can grab some boards here or there. Keon Ellis ranks higher in the last month somehow. Well, yeah, steals. he did have a he did have a five block game against Memphis. Although Steph Curry got a block against Memphis, so how can we? You know, let's let's grade our curve here. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about Ellis before. I don't I don't want to go back. But what I'll say is, you should not be afraid to drop Lopez for Trace Jackson Davis specifically. All right, Reds 22. I don't know if this is Clay Link or, or Jeff Erickson or who. He says, is Cade a drop in a Yahoo points league? He's in the finals. First and foremost, if it's just this week, if your finals are just this week, I think that comes into consideration. Three-game week for Detroit. He's already ruled out tonight. So best case scenario is he plays two games. One of those is a nightmare matchup against Minnesota. The other is the best possible matchup against Washington. So, <laughs> you know, in Washington, they, they play later in the week. So there's a better chance that he plays in that one. That's on Friday uh, the Minnesota game is on Wednesday, but you're, you're looking again at a best case scenario of a two game week for Cade Cunningham. That is very scary. Um, I would, you know, obviously it always depends on who's available, but I think, I think you have to consider it. If you're looking at your opponent and you think they have a better team, they have better matchups they are, They have more projected games than me. These are the kind of kind of like really tough decisions you have to make this time of year. Yeah, some people have two week playoff matchups. I have a buddy that's in a league like that. If it's yeah. a two week playoff matchup, I'm not dropping them. If it's just this week, I would try to find, you know, look at what stats you need, um, however your team is built, and try to find somebody on a four-game week who matches your needs. And assuming that player is pretty decent, um, I think there's a pretty good chance that they outproduce what K does this week on a, on a total total stats basis based on what you need. Yeah, it's just, it's really hard for us to speculate on, like, injuries like this at the end of the year. I just, I have, I have absolutely no idea, you know, if he's going to miss more time. Like there's no, like Detroit's got the worst record in the NBA right now. They are a lock to finish in the bottom four record wise. So there's no, there's no motivation for them to be worse than they have to be. But it's also one of those things where it's like, all right, if, if his knee is really bothering him, there's also no point for him to play. If we think it's something that could, you know, cause further damage, we want him to be as healthy as possible when we're presumably a better team next year. 
Um, you know, the fact that they're being cautious with Fontecchio, cautious with Durin, that, you know, makes you wonder if they would go the same route with Cade. So I, you know, I don't want to be the guy that's like, yes, drop him. And then he comes back and gives you two great games. But when I drop him for a pretty good player on a four game team, yeah, what I think that's, I think the risk reward checks out there. Yep. All right. Uh, we got a Kyle Kuzma question from Roger 888 Roger. He says, do I drop Kyle Kuzma? Uh, Kuzma has already been ruled out for tonight's game. He's kind of been in and out the last couple of weeks. It's a four game week for Washington. So he won't play tonight against, uh, against Chicago. They play Brooklyn Wednesday, Detroit Friday and Miami on Sunday. So still three more opportunities for Kuzma to get out there dealing with a sore shoulder. So this doesn't appear to be anything of, of grave concern here. Um, with the possibility of three games for Kuzma, this one is less of a sure thing for me than, than Cade. Um, I mean, it's a bit concerning that he's missing time now after he missed two games earlier in the week, then played two, and now he's now he's out again. That's a concern. Sort of blindly speaking, I like the advice. I I would be scared to drop Kuzma. It doesn't seem the injury doesn't seem that serious. I I wish they would be more forthcoming about it, obviously. But he's averaging forty one fantasy points a game in March. He's really good. I you know I would be worried that I would drop him and. And he would come back. So I, I would prefer to hang on to Kuzma, not knowing exactly what the what the situation is. I never thought we we would hear that on the pod. Kyle Kuzma, he's really good. He has been good. He's been he's been great in fantasy this year. I'm like I've become like a Kyle Kuzma. Like I I think I whenever I watch him play now, I think he's I'm like this guy's good. Like this guy's almost yeah. he shouldn't be on the Wizards. He should be on some good team playing like. 24 minutes a game, you know, giving them like some, some jolt off the bench. Although that's how I feel about almost everybody on Washington's roster, but you know, Kuzma, yes, he is like a good stats, bad team guy, but I don't think he's like someone who can't scale up and do a better role. We saw it with the, with the Lakers. All right. Uh, do I drop Brandon Miller? This is our next question. Hasn't been playing well. I also have Trey Mann and Nick Richards on the same team. Is this a four game week? for the Charlotte Hornets. So I would proceed with some level of caution here. Yeah. I mean, Miller's been a little spotty of late, you know, he played really well coming out of the all-star break at, at a nice run at the beginning of March, last five games, shooting about 35% from the field, 32% from three, just kind of the, the ups and downs, I would say of, of most rookies, but I mean, the minutes have been there. They don't appear to be shutting him down. So this, this kind of comes back to our age old question of, you know, how many teams are in your league? If it's a 10 teamer, then yeah, you could probably do better. But if it's a 12 or a 14 or a 16 teamer, then you're, you're probably not doing a whole lot better than Brandon Miller on a four game week. Yeah. I just, I, I would not be dropping guys like this on a four game week. Just see what happens this week. If they still are playing terrible and it's a three game week or whatever it is next week, then you can entertain it. But you know, if, if these guys were on the wire and they were on a four game week, we would be telling you to pick them up, you know? So I, I would not, I would not drop Miller on a four gamer. Yeah, I mean, he's been like a borderline top 150 guy uh, since the All-Star break, which is not not ideal. But, um, you know, if you're if you're in a points league, you're not as concerned about that. It's really the field goal percentage and, and really the free throw percentage that's been dragging him down. I mean, he's been under 70 percent at the line um, over the last month or so. Ten team league for for Johnny. So, yeah, again, depends on who's on the waiver wire. If there's a, a better four game player, if there's somebody who can take advantage of injuries. Yeah, maybe maybe you think about it. But, um, you know, not a crazy question by any means. Uh, all right, Daniel says, would you drop Keontae George, Gary Trent, Malik Monk to add any of Najee Marshall, Jose Alvarado, um, or Malik Monk? So for one, I don't I don't know if I'd drop Malik Monk. You know, I, I think with with the Herder injury, there's just there's a lot of upside for Malik Monk the rest of the way. Um, you know, obviously he's coming off of a 0 of 11 game against Orlando. He's been pretty awful shooting the ball lately, but we know Malik Monk, we know that'll probably come back around. That's what you sign up for when you, when you draft a, a, a kind of a streaky player like him. So with no herder, I, I still want Malik Monk, um, Gary Trent, Keontae George, Najee Marshall, Jose Alvarado. That's you know a little bit tougher. Uh, I'm not, I'm not dropping, I'm not dropping any of those guys to add Marshall or, or Alvarado. Yeah. Um, those guys are just, low usage players. They can have their games. Like Alvarado can get four steals in a game. Najee Marshall could have a double double. It can happen. Um, but low usage players and those Keontae George and Gary Trent are they're balling right now. Like they're great. 
Um, yeah. They're winning fantasy leagues for people. And uh, so is Malik Monk to an extent, if you picked him up, especially while he, while he was on a cold streak. So um, yeah. Yeah. Garrett Trent's averaging 25 a game over the last six. I mean, he is, he is loving what's going on in Toronto here. He's basically the, the number one option for, for that team on a lot of nights. So I would not be getting rid of him. Um, all right. A couple more then we'll, we'll head out here. I'll put myself out of my misery. Um, is Julius Randle a drop? He's in the playoffs. He has Anthony Simons and Jalen Johnson on IL already. Yeah, this is a, another tough call, right? Uh, you know, somebody who haven't really had a ton of updates on. The Knicks did tell us earlier today that he's yet to take contact, still working, working on getting strength back in that shoulder. I mean, again, it kind of depends how deep into your playoffs you are, but I... I think we see Julius Randle back before the end of the regular season. It's like, what version of him do we see? There's probably a ramp up period. I think if, if it's do or die and you got to obviously you got to win this round of the playoffs and you already have two guys on IL, I would be comfortable dropping him. Um, I guess maybe the better question is, would you, would you drop Simons before him? I would say probably not just because we have no evidence that that's a longer term injury. Yeah, I, I agree with everything with, with what you said. First of all, Jalen Johnson has, a better fantasy player than, than Randall, um, yeah. like point blank. So, um, and yeah, I mean, Johnson, as far as we know, that's relatively short term. And, and as far as we know, Simons is very short term. So I would, uh, I'd be fairly comfortable dropping Randall. Of course you become more uncomfortable the longer your yeah. lead go league goes, but just how it is. You gotta survive. You gotta survive these playoff rounds. And if that's what it means, then, you know, so be it. Uh, when is Jalen Johnson back? Well, they said he's out at least a week, and that was on the 21st. So expectation would be that he misses at least two more games. They have a back-to-back -back Wednesday, Thursday. I would probably guess he misses both of those. Could be back as soon as Saturday against Milwaukee. I, I just wouldn't count on Jalen or on Jalen Johnson this week. Um, I, I think if your you know if your league extends into next week, it's a four gamer for Atlanta, and they have another four gamer the final week of the regular season, and you're hoping he's back for that. Yeah, I would say just hope that. He's back for early April. Yeah. Um, all right. Two more here, and then we'll we'll bounce out of here. Uh, Isaiah Joe or Aaron Wiggins to stream for this coming Tuesday. Uh, this is an ultimate, like, we're at that point of the season question. Only four games on the schedule on Tuesday, so your options are limited. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're picking between uh, a couple of Thunder players here, OKC on the road at New Orleans. Oh, boy. Um, do, you, do you have a strong thought here, Alex? Well, if you need threes, go Joe. If you don't need threes, go Wiggins. But to me, it's to me, it's about as close of a wash as you could get. And I, I, I think I would rather yeah. have Joe just for the threes upside. Yeah, I mean, Wiggins seems to be have like a slightly higher floor in terms of minutes. Like Joe only played eight minutes the other night against Milwaukee, but that game also got completely out of hand in yeah. the third quarter. I, I, me, I would shoot for the upside with Joe and just hope that he hits like three threes off the bench. Yeah. Um, all right. Going back to one of the previous questions, Daniel said my drop was meant to be Beasley, not Monk. Um, so, I, I mean, if, if let's just say you're choosing between Malik Beasley or Malik Monk, you know, Beasley's going to give you more consistent threes only. Monk's going to give you better, much better assist production, better points overall. I would, I would still go with Malik Monk. I would go Malik Monk by, by a mile to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll end on this one. Jabari Walker, thoughts? Uh, nice open-ended question uh, on Jabari Walker, who uh, I think you and I both like. You know, it's just it's kind of a, a matter of like, all right, are the minutes there? His roles changing night to night? You know, he had that that run in January and February where he was starting a bunch of games. He's mostly been coming off the bench lately, but still playing a decent amount of minutes. Um, you know, really for Portland, it's just like, all right, is Jeremy Grant out there? One is DeAndre Ayton out there too? Um, if not, love Jabari Walker. If those if those guys are in, then obviously his, his ceiling is a little bit lower, but in general, I'm in. Like, if, if you're in, like, a deeper you know, dynasty type of league, I, I really like Jabari Walker. Yeah, I think he's a better dynasty target than, like, this season. But it's really encouraging. Like, he's played double-digit minutes in 38 straight appearances. Like, they're they're putting him out there. They're playing him all the time. Um, his production really fluctuates, but that's because he's, he's sort of a – I don't want to call him a specialist. He's sort of an odd prospect, but in a good way. Like, he's a – he gets to the free throw line a ton, plays super physical – Great offensive rebounder, decent defender. Um, so, yeah, he's he's a little bit undersized at like six foot eight, but he he he's fine. I'm intrigued for mostly for dynasty for this season on a four game week. 
it's fine, but there are probably better options if you're in a standard size league also. Yeah, they're they're on a three gamer this week. They play Houston, Atlanta, Miami. Not not a great schedule other than the Atlanta matchup. Um, his 20 highest minute games this year is averaging 11 points, nine boards, one and a half assists, one block steal. Um, occasional threes, not really some not not really a part of this game right now. But uh, I mean, Portland's just looking for anything at this point, right? You're just kind of trying to find keepers uh, for that roster when you're actually ready to, to semi contend. And, and I think he's looked the part for the most part. Um, all right, that'll do it. We uh, really just dove in on some of the biggest names in the NBA uh, over the last 45 minutes, Alex. But that's that's the point of the season that we're at. Uh, we appreciate everybody still watching along, listening, uh, firing us good questions. Uh, you know, good to see so many regulars in the chat who are still alive in their fantasy playoffs. So we hope we can continue to give you advice. You're still alive this time next week. We'll be back on Monday. We'll have Dr. A tomorrow. Uh, myself and Brandon Kravitz on Wednesday. Dr. A and Rick Campbell on Thursday. Uh, you guys, are, are you still talking waiver wire every Friday? It's got to be. We big. are. I don't. I don't remember when our when our last uh, when our last show is, but we are still doing it. All right, excellent. You can check out Alex and I Monday through Friday on the Roadwire NBA show. If you're a SiriusXM listener, uh, SiriusXM NBA seven to seven thirty p.m. Eastern. We'll be previewing a monster Monday night slate. We got eleven games coming at us tonight, so check us out over on SiriusXM NBA seven to seven thirty p.m. Eastern.